Okay, where I'd like to go next, uh, we've been talking so far about just an asset. You know, could be this table, chair, a machine. But what about intangibles? We have talked about intangibles, uh, maybe the appropriate word is ad nauseum over the past 10 weeks, whatever. What about intangibles with regard to this? Okay. Now, when you were looking at your project assignment, what did most of the companies do with regard to getting their intangibles offshore? Was there some sort of either a sale or a license? Or was there a transfer in exchange for stock? Okay, a sale or a license? Okay, now this is important. Is a sale or license covered by what Jen read in 367A? No, it's not. Because a sale or a license is not covered by 351, uh, 332, and all of the uh, rest of those, uh, those numbers. A, sa a, a sale or a license is not at all covered by 367. Rather, if the IRS wants to question it, which many of you have seen they do, uh, Microsoft and Facebook and, and others, the IRS is questioning the transfer pricing under Section 482. You valued it too low. You should have valued it much higher. And as a result, X would have to recognize additional income and pay more tax because they undervalued the transferred intangibles. But what about the transfer of intangibles in exchange for stock? We just said that 367A makes it effectively immediately taxable if you have like a 351 transaction uh, with this transfer of intangibles in exchange for stock. Maybe it's easy to value this table and the chair and some machine, but we all know it's an absolute pain. It's a real pain to value intangibles. So what did, the, uh, did Congress do? Okay, what does Section 367D, as in David, say? Okay, read it out loud so that uh, <laughs> everybody can hear it. Special rules relating to transfers of intangibles. Number one, in general, except as provided in regulations prescribed by the Secretary, if the United States person transfers any intangible property to a foreign corporation in an exchange described in Section 351 or 361, Subsection A shall not apply to the transfer of such property, and the provisions of this subsection shall not um, okay. shall, shall apply to the transfer. Okay, stop there because I think then it gets a bit, a little bit convoluted. But uh, so let's talk about what it does say, and I do uh, encourage you to, uh, at a very minimum, scan through 367D. It's a major and important area uh, of, uh, of this, uh, this section. Okay, so let's, let's say that, uh, that Y, uh, I'm sorry, that X has transferred in exchange for shares some intangibles, some IP. Now, section 367D recognizes that it's terrible to have to value intangibles at one point in time. So what it does is it says we take, in essence, an after-the-fact approach. We treat it as if there had been a transaction where the intangibles are transferred in exchange for a series of payments which are based on the utilization by Y of those intangibles. In other words, they're saying calculate a series of payments over the next number of years, which is what 
you would have if you had a royalty in essence. Treat it like it was sold for a series of payments which are economically, a series of payments which is economically a royalty based on usage or uh, disposition of the, uh, of the intangibles. You're making so much noise, I can't hear her. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> go ahead. You're going to set up an, an installment agreement to use or to transfer the IP? Well, you don't have, this is by statute, you don't have to set up any agreement. And in fact, the only agreement would be the transfer in exchange for shares. Don't forget to chew quietly. Uh, yeah, the, there's, there's no agreement for, for payments. By statute, it's saying X will treat this not as you know, a, uh, a realization event this year you know, where we have to come up with a value. Rather, the transfer is made and X will have to recognize each and every year for as long as that IP has any value an amount which would be what a royalty would be. And the commensurate with income concept, which we saw in the transfer pricing area, applies here. If the uh, IP becomes quite valuable in the future, then that annual payment would go up. If it, you know, it generates a lot of income for Y each year, increasingly, it would go up. If at some point the IP becomes less valuable, it would go down. So much of that seems contingent upon what Y does with the IP. Well, of course, but... So X could end up paying more for something. Oh, absolutely. This was... <laughs> that seems ridiculous. <laughs> this was an approach. This was an approach which Congress put in some number of years ago. I, I want to say it was in the early 80s that they put this Section 367D in. And so it, was, it was meant to absolutely yeah, clobber. And it was actually back then worse than it is now. So it's intended to keep IP onshore. Yeah, it. absolutely. You know, and consistent with this economic concept of we're creating a royalty, then Y is allowed uh, to, when it calculates its earnings and profits, to reduce its earnings and profits by the amount of that income inclusion in, in X. This is why none of the companies that we studied did this. Oh, they try to avoid this like the plague. Now, you remember when we talked about uh, transfer pricing, you know, if a transfer pricing adjustment is made, uh, if the amount is not repaid to the U.S. company in some way, there will be a mismatch in terms of the tax results and the real accounting for the catch, so to speak. Well, the same thing's true here. Uh, there's an income recognition by X, but to get back to what Lunil was saying, there's no agreement, actual agreement, under which Y can, in fact, make a payment to X. There's no legal way for Y to make a payment to X. So you have a mismatch. Okay, how does the, the code and regulations deal with this? Well, X is considered to have an account receivable for the amount of that income inclusion. And if it's not paid within three years, X can increase its basis in uh, the shares of, uh, of Y. Now, this is really an approach that is meant to clobber uh, and to uh, really discourage outbound tax-free transfers. Is it possible that a company could do this by accident? Yeah, do you think, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, today, IP, uh, which was, uh, or the definition of intangible property was expanded by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. If uh, X, for example, 
you know, send some employees down to Y, and as a result, Y is able to conduct a new business, and Y uses those intangibles, but there's no documentation of it, well, that's something that would be caught by this. Now, I think it's fair to say that probably in a lot of large multinationals, they probably have a, a reasonable handle on what their intellectual property is. But I suspect that a lot of mid-size and definitely smaller companies that start doing things overseas, they may not realize that they are necessarily transferring intangibles over. I certainly saw this a number of times over the years uh, when I was working in various locations outside the United States. All of a sudden, a new subsidiary starts a business and becomes reasonably profitable. Well, there ought to be some sort of documentation that there's a real license or a real sale of something. If there's nothing, if it's just been you know, the use has been allowed essentially as a contribution to capital, then it's caught by this. So I, I think it's not so much that you plan to be, you know, in this <laughs> section. It's that I think a lot of times you will, you will find clients or companies that unexpectedly find themselves being hit by this.